welcome to another episode of Dying with Diabetes in America. I am your host, Michelle Robinson. Today with me, I have an amazing diabetic. And I say amazing diabetic because I have watched his his surgeries in our group in a dead pancreas society. So I'm going to bring him on right now. And hello to Michael Nichols. How are you doing today? I'm hanging in there. Nice, nice. So, dude, like, okay. So, before we get into who you are, where you are, blah, 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 blah. How are you? Just in a general, how are you doing right now? You had some tubes pulled out of you. Yeah, I had the uh, dialysis catheter pulled out of my, my chest earlier today. <laughs> At that, because they finally got to the AV. AV graft working on my arm for the dialysis. So that took them about, they were supposed to be pulled out in 90, they're supposed to normally be pulled out in 90 days, but because of the COVID and stuff, they slowed right. down all the surgeries and I ended up waiting from March clear to now. <laughs> God damn. So, all right. So let's get now into the who, what, when, where, why. So your name, Michael Nichols, where are you coming to us from? I am living in Independence, Missouri, which is a small little area next to Kansas City, Missouri. Pretty much in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, cool beans. And were you diagnosed type 1 from the start, or were you, like, manhandled by type 2? Uh, no, I was, uh, ironically, uh, I'm sure most diabetics know this, but uh, an enterovirus, which is a pretty common thing you can get from, like, chicken pox, the flu, even scarlet fever, which is my, yeah. my case. Um, that gets into your, your gut and basically causes your immune system to go, I don't know how to identify a friend from foe anymore. And that's right. what attacked the pancreas and, sh and shut me down at the age of seven. So that's what attacked your beta, attacked your beta cells Correct. for your pancreas and ruined them. And that sucks. Anybody else in your family, like, does any of them have type one? Well, it's kind of weird because I, I've, I've read up a lot about it and it's like right. every other generation in my family. So I'm trying to, I was always kind of curious as to whether or not it was generational or if it was genetic or, or how much, how much of a variance that played into it. So but doctors still really don't, can't tell you one way or another if it's genetic. No, totally. Not that like I've had relatives in the past, like it's every other generation in my family and my dad's side has had someone who's had it. And our generation, me and my cousin both have type one, but we've mm -hmm. actually survived. Whereas previous generations, they died off in their 20s. I think that the unfortunate death rate has a lot to do with it. Uh, they couldn't understand it as much, even when you figure what 1922 was when insulin kind of came out and then it was animal insulin. So who knows who was allergic to what animal? And then you get the synthetic and human insulin. I think it makes it makes a huge difference. So I know that I'm the only type one in my family. Um, I even did that weird genetic test, and it was like, oh my god, you're predisposed for type two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? But, I mean, that's just me being hateful. So, yeah. I, it, but it's one of those things that, who knows, maybe two or three generations back, I had a great, great, great grandmother or whatever that died of type 1 and nobody knew. It's, I don't like that they can't tell you a reason. I well, hate that. The thing, I, the thing that's interesting about my family is on both sides, my mom and my dad's side of the family, there is actually a pretty good history going back. And really? on my father's side, I had a, a great aunt who actually passed away in what they called back then institutions, where they used uh, to gotcha. send people like tuberculosis and other diseases yeah. that would you'd die from. I had a, she died. She is it's pretty much what recorded. That's what she died from was eating a carrot, carrot and celery diet. It was how she spent the last year or two of her life. I mean, my grandfather had a brother who passed away from it. They found him in his apartment. So, I mean, it, it there's, a, there's a track record there. It's just 
the variance on whether or not you'll actually get it is like, I think for men, if you carry it, it's like a one in 20 odd that your kid will, will end up with it. And then with women, it's like one in 17. Yeah. And that's some BS. <laughs> I get really mad. I get really mad at the fact that, okay, only 5% of your insulin has to screw up to make you a type one diabetic. Like what mm -hmm. kind of, why can't I have those odds anywhere else? Like why <laughs> exactly. can't I play the lottery and be like, bam, 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 bam. I'll, no, no, I have to get diabetes and that's crap. And so I've been going to your, and if you don't mind speaking about it, your recent health issues. Mm -hmm. I think you immediately caught my eye, one for your eye surgeries. So I Three things. Okay. One, I developed cataracts at 36 and didn't realize what it was until two years ago. Right. So I started seeing milky haze around my eyes and things like that. Right. I'm like, why am I getting sometimes getting cloudy vision? Mm -hmm. And things like that. It was worse in the left eye because I had received an injury at the age of 13 in my left eye. Always wear safety goggles when working around a wood chipper, kids. Gotcha. Um, Follow that's it. When, uh, they had to take, I had spent two years putting eye ointment in my ear after, uh, in my left eye after that. So I always figured there was probably some serious damage to the left eye already. So I wasn't too bothered about having vision, vision issues start up there. Right. And then I noticed it was in my right eye as well. I was like, huh, what's going on? I'm, you know, I was expecting cataracts around 40 to 50 years of age, like most people, but yeah. didn't know that's what it was. And then I went in and got uh, the typical yearly retinopathy study done, which I have moderate retinopathy already. 80% of diabetics develop some form of it. But I, I, you, yeah, as diabetics, we have to know, we have to test these things because we're not going to be able to tell the difference. And people don't get that. It, it, you're not going to realize when things go really bad because you're so used to them. So thank you for bringing that up. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. And the third and final thing is what they call macular edema, which is where blood vessels in the back of your eye, your retina area back there where the rods and cones are all sitting. Yeah. But that will start bleeding a little bit. They start letting out a little bit of blood, just a little bit at a time. And slowly over time, your eye starts getting filled up with that and having issues. If, and I was lucky I found out because I thought all I had was cataracts at first. So I was going to do cataract surgery, and I went to this place to get it done. And if I had stayed there and done the surgery instead of listening to my gut and having a bad feeling about the place, they were running it like a butcher shop, cattle uh. lined up. 40 people in the waiting room area to get it to be operated on. Nope. I'm out of there. <laughs> went, really. to another, went to another place with a better eye doctor who actually teaches at uh, KU university here in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Dr. Singh, legendary doctor, as far as I'm concerned, he did awesome. a more thorough analysis of my eyes. And he said, if they had, if they had started that operation, I would have lost my left eye. So that was back in August That's of last year. That's insane. And what he said I needed to have done was gradual injections done twice a month mm -hmm. for at least six months before they could stop the swelling in the in the blood vessels from getting worse in the back of the eye. Right. And that because if you if you cut open an eye and you got blood vessels already ruptured inside there, guess what's going to happen? It's going to bleed out. Exactly, and that eye is not going to be salvageable. So they have to go in with lasers and basically cauterize all the ruptured blood vessels. I'm not going to lie. Every time you post an update, I have to like one eye it because I get really, I, I never thought I would be put through the transplant that I was because I was a really big wuss. We're going to say it like that because it's nicer. <laughs> I was super wuss. I was a take my blood. I'm going to pass out. I'm going to cry. I might vomit. Who knows? And then I got pregnant. And they, t oh, my God, they took so much blood from me. You're like, I'm trying to grow an eyeball. And they're like, <laughs> we need 12 vials. And I think that's what pushed me into the being a guinea pig. 
because I'm like, all right, I have, I mean, yeah, being a guinea pig, I gave 45 vials at a time in five hours. Okay. Not at like one hour in five hours. I gave 45 vials to be considered for my transplant, but I was ready for it. What readied you for like the knowledge that shit's going haywire and you need to buckle up buttercup at this point? Well, I wasn't really, as I know to say, wasn't really given a choice. So I, was, right. I kind of went into, when I was diagnosed on August 13th of 1988 in Denver, Colorado. And the way I found out was it wasn't my brother had just been born. So my dad thought I was just doing things for attention, like intentionally oh, letting the bed or staying up late and sneaking into the kitchen to get food because I was constantly right. hungry. I didn't know I was basically starving to death. And I only weighed about 60 pounds by the time they found out something was wrong with me. How old were you at the time? Seven. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, I mean, you were a little. Mm. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I was going to say, ironically, I was very lucky because it was a Saturday and my dad had set up these big plans. There's there this restaurant called the Blue Moose in, in Denver, Colorado. That he, he, he had already set up arrangements that he took my mom to every year for their anniversary to celebrate. Mm -hmm. It was an anniversary. My mom just knew something wasn't right in her gut and decided, well, I'm going to take him to the clinic this morning. And if she hadn't taken me to the clinic that, that morning, I would have been dead because I, I literally collapsed and fell into a coma. Uh, and she, they rushed me to the hospital, and then I spent the next several months going through uh, learning about the basics of type 1 diabetes at the time back in the 80s. And that was before, uh, before the DCC trials and all that stuff. <laughs> so I was basically a yeah. guinea pig from the start. <laughs> I mean, we have people who have tested their urine to, like, I've had people on who have had to boil needles and stuff so it's a it's crazy to think where we've come oh yeah i mean back in the day when i was diagnosed the walmart version of insulin was the insulin that you used you when know I first was, got, yeah when i go. first got diagnosed i'm sorry um no, go ahead. no it no, was go the ahead. animal insulin still yeah, so it was like this bullshit insulin that wouldn't work as as soon as they said it would, and it wouldn't work for as long as they said it would, so you were constantly guessing, and I remember even mixing long-acting and short-acting in the same needle and, like, having to roll it to make sure everything was cloudy so you know it mixed, and that's... Exactly. It's crazy. And to now see where we've become. So, like, okay, for you, what kind of tech are you rocking right now? Uh, I've wrecked, I've rocked the CGM, which yeah. I'm not a big fan of Dexcom anymore. So, I me. saw, I saw, oh, I always said F, F, Dexcom. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of there with you. So, I'm like halfway on the way. I'm on the price range of mm -hmm. there with you. Like, I always had to pay out of pocket for mine. So it's $1,500 a month. Me and my doctor had to fight two years just to get the Dexcom G5. And you and got CD, it? They finally got it for a year. And then they switched us over to the G6 and it's having all sorts of problems. I, I still can't even use it. <laughs> I mean, I have I started since it was the G4, and I've been fighting, and all of my insurances, you know, they all say the same thing. You don't need it. It's not a necessity. It's a commodity. Medicare has this nasty thing where you have to wait a couple years after you get a new product yeah. before they'll, they'll replace it with something else. Your insulin pump, four years. Dexcom or CGM, two to three years. So, so you another... get Medicare. Yeah. And I think it's great who they can help. I think it's great that they've approved the CGMs for seniors. Because, I mean, okay, so obviously you can mirror that. Like, listen here, MFers. If you think grandma and grandpa need it, then you <laughs> should think that your cute little niece nephew doesn't matter who they need it to 
So the nasty thing about Social Security is, unfortunately, mm -hmm. they look at everybody as an individual case by case thing. And they do that with yeah. your health conditions, too. Oh, you yeah. got type 1 diabetes. OK, that's one thing. You have hypothyroidism. That's its own thing. You have gastroparesis. That's its own thing. You have seizures. That's its own thing. You're deathly allergic to animal insulin. That's its own thing. Look at it collectively, what it does to you. And this is the key word I want people to remember. Residual functional capacity. Get yourself a disability lawyer and get yourself a lawyer that knows what those three, three words mean. Because if everything combined together affects your residual functional capacity to where you are not able to function effectively in any job more than 20%, you're automatically considered disabled by the federal government. Okay, so I have to put a thing in here. Residual, say it again. Residual functional capacity. Residual functional capacity. Words. Because when I went in for my third interview is Social Security, and I was like, listen, after, because you know the guy that talks about all the jobs that you can have, and I was like, that's fine. How yeah, many of those jobs... Well, I was like, how many of those jobs are going to give me time to take care of a high or a low? Who is going to be compassionate enough for my diabetes to still give me a job? And I have to say, even the lawyer was like, that's a good question. And in my head, I'm like, why isn't that a normal question? Why isn't well, that just knowledge? Well, that's the thing is my lawyer, unfortunately, here, because uh, we took it took eight years to get mine from 2006 to 2014, 2006, when I originally applied 2014, when they finally gave me an appeal hearing. And Holy the, crap. Judge, the judge really? apologized to me after the voc rehab lady, when they my lawyer asked that question, how many jobs in the U.S. economy are going to accommodate all of his medical needs? Yeah. And will he be able to effectively compete for with his residual functional capacity? And the book rehab lady just sat there, looked at all the paperwork, she says, zero. There are zero jobs for this in, in, in the economy right now. And that's what it is. I don't care how many minutes I can, I can sit in a stoop or I can bend down. That doesn't matter. It's, it's when you have the extreme lows or the extreme highs and... You can't deal with the effects. And to think about, like, for me personally, how long I've been dealing with the stupid effects and how I made sure it was never a problem for my job, it makes you angry. Oh, yeah. Or and when you have to have three to four jobs just to keep your head above water financially. Right. Just to get your medicine so you don't screw up at the job. And then you realize when filing for stuff, it's like, no, you needed those emergency calls. You needed those people to go, oh, my God, we don't know what to do so that you had paperwork substantiating what you're saying. And it's exactly. So tell me, tell me the things that you're dealing with now as a result of the crazy BD's life. I saw it was, was dialysis a part of it. Yeah, that started up in March. I knew is I knew back in November and the year before when I started having uh, foot edema is what they call right. it, foot and ankle edema. There's some swelling and I knew there were some issues developing with the pain, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, kidneys. Right. Cause and we all it, know swelling is never a good thing. It never yeah. says anything. Woo woo. But well, that's what made you look into it? Well, that's what made my doctors look at it first. Gotcha. Um, I've got a host of specialists I have to go see routinely. No, um, that's great. I'm sorry. Do you yeah, see how many people don't see specialists? Like, they don't see, they only see their primary care. They don't even see endocrinologists. And it's like, it's, I, I don't understand that. And that's what pisses me off, too, because I can think of all of my primary cares, the nurses and what have you that didn't know jack about my diabetes. That were all like, oh, my God, when were you diagnosed? Are you sure you're a type one? 
Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but it really makes me mad. When you think I'm seeing a medical professional, you all should know everything about what I'm asking you, or at least tell me, hey, I need to do some more research into this. But don't pacify me and think that you know what you're doing and then you screw me. Oh, so yeah. I'm sorry. I'll just put that out there. So, you know, dialysis. It's sweeping it underneath the rug or the white coat syndrome, as I like to jokingly call it. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, you realize that things were going wonky. And so, I mean, that made you, your doctors look into it more. And then yeah. I, I don't know much about dialysis. I'm not going to lie. Like, I, it, I've heard of it. I have seen the places where you go, but I don't understand it as the, to put it simply, basically that your kidneys are what they call the filters of the body. You're, right. You've got all this fluid flowing around through your blood, water. You're, you're pretty much 80% water anyways. Right. And, and all that, all that has to be cleaned out because every time you eat something, every time you process something with your body, Mm -hmm. uh, it creates waste. There's there's stuff right. left over. I mean, we don't. It's like I, I I like to make the comparison to little kids. Like you know, whenever you you make a microwave dinner, you know all that mm -hmm. leftover paper and plastic and stuff that comes with that microwave dinner. That's mm -hmm. what your kidneys are trying to get rid of. They're that's get a rid great of way to look at it, though. In all honesty, they're the they're the trash compactors of your body. <laughs> I no, I really really like that because it gives a very very visual problem a a you know a way to solve it so i i like that i like that a lot i'm gonna have to use that with my daughter <laughs> basically but their I job do. is to filter your blood keep it clean uh yeah. take any excess out of it. that's why sugar if you have too much of it in your bloodstream actually that damages the filters in your kidneys over time right. and it's one of the leading causes for a lot of diabetics who develop complica complications for what leads to our death. It, yeah. but that it may not be the diabetes itself that's written on the death certificate. It'll be kidney failure or heart disease or one of the eventual complications that catches up with us. It's a complication of the disease itself. No matter how mm -hmm. you want to trace it back, it normally will be traced back to the, the, uh, the immediate problem of diabetes. And then with type one, you have the double whammy of the autoimmune I condition. Know, such as well. bullshit. <laughs> so, but they didn't tell me what was frustrating at first when I was a kid because they didn't know it back then. There were, I guess, there weren't enough clinical studies by there confirming this. Mm -hmm. But now they know for sure that if you have one autoimmune disease, your chances increase by X amount of percentage for you developing two. And if you have two, then you're likely to have three or four increases yeah. even more. With me. <laughs> Cheesy peasy five. I make one in sixty thousand people basically out of the type ones. Not all type ones are like me in that sense because some of you get lucky and you only get one or two at most. Like hypothyroidism <laughs> yeah, is the it's, second most it's common. It's funny. I'm sure you appreciate the ha ha's of like we might only get two or three. <laughs> like it sucks anyway you go around it. But oh, yeah. Jesus five. Yeah. And at the end of the at the end of the day, my immune system is so uh, friendly, fire, happy, as I like to call it. It's still attacking me now. So I can't wait to get on that donate donor list and finally get on some immunosuppressants that will stop it from attacking my own body. and everything down. Because nine times out of ten, that's what's going to kill me before anything else. Before immunosuppressives. Be and I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I realized it did. But. Immunosuppressives are rough. I was on them for almost five years. Um, after I didn't accept my first transplant, it was discovered it was because I had a rabbit protein allergy. Oh, and wow. yeah, and what they use to bring down your immune system has a rabbit protein in it. So the first two doses they give you, they give you with steroids and you're like, okay, 
I don't give a shit. And then the last one, they tell you, they're like, this is going to hurt. This is going to make you feel like you have the flu. And I woke up and I was super red. So red. I like, that's all I was. I look like a lobster. I look like a very, very angry lobster. And it was because I was allergic to this rabbit protein. But they had to take me down and they had to do my transplant because they had everything set up like you couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. And they took me down and they did it and they had to give me a massive amount of steroids after because they had to drop like 120 milligrams of Benadryl in my pick line right next to my heart. Yeah. And... I, of course, don't remember any of it because I was asleep. But, (laughs) yeah, I know, right? But, I mean, it was was scary. It was scary. And then when they were like, hey, it's not working, boo-hoo you. (laughs) I was like, boo-hoo me. And they're like, if you stay on the immunosuppressives, if we get you set up for another transplant, you won't have to worry about any medicine. She'll already be on the transplants. And I was like, hell to the yeah, I'll stay on them. But they are great. And from my second transplant, if I could have just used those immunosuppressants, I'd still be on them now. Oh, yeah. My body, well, my body decided the second transplant it didn't like either. And it was like, ha, 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 I kill you. It was the Lori Petty of my days, really. That's the thing I worry about the most is as aggressive as my my T cells are at the Uh end of the day, uh, whether or not they'll reject both the kidney and pancreas transplant when I get them and just how how much of those immunosuppressants I'm going to need because it's already shut down, you know, my uh, vagus nerve, which is part of my autonomic nerve nervous system, which affects right. your heart rate, affects your, right. your ability to do a ton of things. It's already attacked other parts of my body, shut off my gallbladder and had to have that removed. Mm-hmm. But then it's gone after my kidneys. It's gone after my adrenal glands. It's gone after my thyroid. So there isn't much left functioning at this point where I, I, I either have to take this gamble and, and and do it all now or, you know, I've only got two to five years at best on dialysis is what the estimates are. Because eight now, thousand people wait, die waiting for organs. <laughs> right. Now, a BS question. Prior to this, I mean, it sounds like from your post you had a handle on things. Was it just a domino effect of things that brought you to this? It's what I call a very slow, gradual sneak attack. Basically, uh, type 1 diabetes, and then I started having issues at 13 with hypothyroidism. Right. Started noticing problems with it. I'd have to say the catalyst for a little bit was... Uh, at the when I was first diagnosed, I was allergic mm. to the animal insulin. So I'd go into insulin shock every night. My parents would turn into the room. And oh juice. my gosh! Orange juice and treat me that way for until the human RNA insulin came out, the old garbage version of Walmart insulin. Everybody. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I, I hate it. I, hate, I know. Okay, so side note, I know there are people that have worked great for yay for them, love them. However. Mm-hmm. Walmart insulin is like it's almost guaranteeing your complications. Oh my god, it totally is. I hate it. So yeah, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So you were using that bullshit until they came out with the human insulin. Yeah, and then after the human insulin, then I sort of was on that for um, nearly a decade, and then finally got switched over to Novolog and and, and other versions of long acting insulin that were better for us. <laughs> but more expensive. You know, I hear a lot about people who have had a lot of complications with their diabetes. I have a very good friend of mine that's almost blind in one eye because she didn't have the proper care. I hate this. And I'm so sorry. 
that's things my dad was my dad my both my parents worked really hard to try and stay on top of getting my supplies and they had to fight with the insurance company when i was a kid <sighs> with even get the insulin pump they had to sue them <laughs> <sighs> so at the end of the day um uh, it's just a what's killing more diabetics than anything else isn't us you know not taking care of ourselves or mm-hmm. being belligerent and being brittle and, and all that that's all baloney what's killing us is not having enough supplies things being too expensive and the fact that no matter how hard we work we're always drowning in debt or not able to pay off it i mean i literally had when i was working full-time i had four jobs and i still haven't decided between paying my electric bill or paying my rent or buying my insulin bottles yeah uh, i i'm not gonna lie i feel you on that it's like <laughs> I, I, I love my husband, but we got married a year early because my insurance was going to change and I was going to lose my insurance coverage for everything. Like the, the new coverage, it was through an employer and the new coverage was like stupid, ridiculous amount of money. And it was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And that's that's all the things you look at because at the end of the day, you can either try to go on the websites for the vendors or for the manufacturers themselves. And like, I know Nova log, there's a thing right now going on that will give you a discounted amount of insulin. So shout out to a all. little bit of time, but I mean, just, I mean, look, just give us a little bit. It sucks the little bits, but we have to hold on to that. We have to fight for more. But that's when we show that, like, I know I couldn't pay the price for uninsured insulin. I couldn't pay that. That was $1,500. And I only know that because I went through Medicaid. And so they out of pocket for me. What was that? Twenty five hundred dollars out of pocket for me. All right. Months of <laughs> I only know because Medicaid was like, we're gonna charge you one thousand three hundred and twenty three dollars a month, and if you don't hit that, we're not covering shit. And I'm like, <laughs> here's my insulin bill. Go ahead. <laughs> They wouldn't cover anything else, though. Still, even these days, I can't get covered for anything other than a pen, an insulin mm. pen, or a vial. And it's like, I, I'm i getting too old to hold the vial <laughs> expel all the air and have to do... I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. But it just becomes impossible to keep up with, especially as things start to develop over time. Cause I keep telling people it's, it's, it's one of those things that just keeps gradually, gradually, gradually. It's like, it's like a water tank slowly filling up and you're at the top. there, just trying to keep yep. your head just high enough out of the water so you can breathe. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you're it is. totally like, right. It's, it's, it's unfortunate because like you see, the things on Massachusetts with the, I don't remember his name, but he's the one that developed the closed loop system, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. I really honestly do. I have a problem. I can't. Okay. So I feel like I can't use the control IQ and the T slim. I don't want those many things plugged into me. Well, that's, I, that's the sad I, part about it all is it's all this tech, all this expensive tech is being pushed on us, but we can't even afford that. <laughs> or what if, can't, <laughs> yeah, well, what if we can't? Yeah, what if we can afford the batteries to go into it? Exactly. <laughs> like I, I mean, that's where I come to the problem of I can't order it. It's, I mean, I had a problem with Medtronic and and the other companies throughout the years because. Before Omnipod, I couldn't get a needle through my scar tissue. It was like my scar tissue was like, nope, nobody's coming through. And that's just the way it was. So it wasn't until, so I had Omnipod and I loved it. 
And then I sacrificed myself to be a guinea pig. There was no woo-woos in between. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, I don't... I think if people had to look at the size of the needles and the angles of the needles every day that we have to look at, I think it would be more eye-opening for them. Like, oh... Mm -hmm. So you oh, want to have that double calf latte? <laughs> you know, this one for the first insulin pump that right. I went on. Do you remember the silhouette in oh, yeah. that? Oh, oh, so that's what I grew up with. And that's what gave me. And I was 45 degree angle into the stomach and just push. And then you'd push and you'd hit scar tissue and it would stop. And then blood would spurt out the end. And you were like, Jesus, I'm going to have to pull Ooh, this doctor, out. Doctor, after, after, after being on the H-tron, uh, Desitronic H-tron Plus. I was on that too! Until they found out it wasn't waterproof. And it was yeah, overdosing. Some bullshit. <laughs> and it was some bullshit <laughs> anyway. It was a huge ass pump. I mean, Jesus. And I still have scar tissue around the gut from where I had to put those long needles in. I had to do it through the 2000s because like, I, I, yeah, no, it was, it was some BS. It was before really the internet was really there. So I was, I was riding that crap. And I mean, it was just try this, try this, look, this auto inserter and I'd watch it bounce off my skin. It would no bounce off. There was, there was no. There was no connection. I will remember sitting there like seven or eight quick certs or whatever they were, quick sets. And I'm like, none of these are going to stick. I'm just bleeding. I'm bleeding everywhere. I could check my blood sugar and bleeding so much. So it's why I love Omnipod like itself so much. Because- the 630G, which it turns out they recalled that one, so I ended up sending the one I had back, and then they replaced it with another 630G, so I have to wait another four years now for a new insulin pump. That's so a the for those, They're not too bad. Yeah. At that, But I still get, it's like, I can't do anything in the abdomen with those, so I pretty much have to do it on my side and the hips. And uh, that's the only place I can do the inserts now. And I'm still, they're slowly but surely building up. The it's, it's rough because no matter where you use it, you're building up scar tissue. So it's oh, yeah. like, okay, I'm good on my legs. Okay. I've built up scar tissue on my legs. I didn't find that that scar tissue went down, at least for me in my abdomen until after my really kind of, three years into my transplant process when I wasn't doing it on my abdomen. But I feel as, as for us, for diabetics, you don't get a three year reprieve from yeah. any spot. <laughs> it's like, I tell people all the time, all the scar tissue that's, I don't know if you can see it very well here. It, ah, Cause it's so the two thirds of my body is like my arm now. It's walking sucks. demonstration of what human human carnage looks like. <laughs> yes. Or how, what has made us the way we are throughout the years. I know that there, I that I still can't feel parts of my stomach anymore. Hmm. It's like if what well, frustrated me about like the JDRF and the American Diabetes Association is just how they've de- how much t- time they've been wasting devoting to new technology. It's just basically doing the same job the insulin pump or the CGM is already doing. Yeah. And we need to be going back. Why are we only spending seven seven percent of every dollar donated to these organizations on actually researching a cure anymore? <laughs> it's totally true. I mean, I will tell you, I watched an entire medical team fight not understanding why my body in particular was fighting against the immunosuppressives. And I was on badass immunosuppressives. Like I was on at 1.42 pills a day. And that was while I was off insulin. But mm-hmm. my my immune system 
My immune system is the Mahalid Ali of my life. <laughs> and it's just like, no, done. And that's what it did. But to watch them study the cells and look into the science of it, I think was amazing. And that's what we need more. We need more people that are like, I don't, I can put a band aid on it until, you know, the next decade. But how do you well, make it better? And get worse. <laughs> yeah. It's how, you know, how do we, how do we try to make it better? And so like for my foundation that sponsored me, they were doing more child things, trying to catch somebody that had been diagnosed in the last five years and preserving their beta cells, which I think is great. But I told them, I'm like, that's awesome but you still don't know what causes type 1 diabetes. Maybe we just want to look into that. There's got to be some DNA thing in us that goes, nope, next, you're not going to make insulin. That's how I me, feel. What's got me kind of curious, because I saw a Nova special on it once about uh, CRISPR. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Mm-mm. Look it up. C R I S P R. Uh, it's had a not that uh, that cooking thing, right? No. Okay. This is about okay. rewriting DNA, and they're they've been working on it. Uh, they've had success with it so far with sickle cell anemia, being okay. able to write, being able to rewrite the DNA so that the sickle cells don't f aren't, aren't forming as much anymore for people who have that condition. Wow. Now, if they're able to do that with what CRISPR is, it allows you to take certain segments of the DNA and reprogram them to heal and uh, and fix themselves. And if they can figure that out in, in combination with adult stem cells and with uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, which is primarily a trigger of the immune, autoimmune system, right. there might be an avenue that way. I know Dr. Faustman wow. did a lot of research into reversing it with type 1, type 1 diabetes in mice and has been working with the, uh, I believe it's called the BCG vaccine which is a former tuberculosis vaccine i've heard about the tuberculosis vaccine it was um originally started to be used in massachusetts and there's a doctor up there but it's a chick and she was just yeah, like i think amazing. we should do this and yes i i, I guess we decided not to help fund her <laughs> I, I i think that the way that we are branching out to help and to, or to, I mean, to cure or to make our life a little better. Like, okay, maybe you can't cure me. Maybe you can just give me an effusion every six months. That makes me just have to take long acting, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I promise I won't eat like shit. And you give me something that can make me feel better. Or at the very least, using less and less insulin, because that's what the results in our clinical studies have been showing so far, is people that are on it for a certain amount of time, they've been decreasing the amount of insulin they need to take. Absolutely. Yeah. And we know with the less insulin we have to take, the less complications we have in the future from it. I mean, also with stabilized blood sugar, totally, for a long time of our life, we've just been like, no, it's okay if you no, you'll be fine if you. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me sad because somebody like yourself that has had problems, this is the kind of ignorance that we need to fight. So I keep telling people it forced me to, it's basically forced me to be disabled. I live on 830 some odd dollars a month. I live in. I have to live in poverty just to keep my Medicare and Medicaid. And that's the only yeah, thing keeping me alive. because it counts against medicine. you for everything you own, which I think is BS. Oh, yeah. Uh, I tell people at the end of the day, I don't like living like this. I like no. If I was anywhere else in the world, any other developed world, developed nation in the world, my health care is taken care of. And I would be able yeah. to still work. <laughs> because it wouldn't be a pre-existing condition. It would mm -hmm. be your medical history. And that's I'd it. I'd be able to have an office job somewhere. It'd be awesome. Yep. But this, this from the time I was 
2006 to now has nixed the rest of my life because I, I ended up having to drop out of drop out of college. I ended up having to uh, go into a nursing home to get, get disability. And now I'm stuck living in my apartment with my cat and all by myself. I can never get married because of it. Most people don't know this. If you become disabled, if you get married to someone who has a job, for instance, they, they count all that bullshit. And they take your Medicare and your disability yep. and your Medicaid away. I wasn't working when I applied for Medicaid. And my husband was. Uh, we have a daughter. And because we owned both our cars, they wouldn't cover us. It was yep. like, nope, you already earned too much. And it was like, wait a minute. Because we own our car so what we should sell a car and then only one of us could work like the logistics never worked out uh -huh. and it was just yeah it was even on my even even on my ssdi which is 836 a month my social security disability income right i make too much for apply to apply for on 836 a month i according to the ssi i make too much too much to to qualify for SSI even on that. Such bullshit. In my state. It's it's such complete bullshit. And then when you think about, I don't know about you, but when I looked about going into the military services, it was not advised for people with type one. Oh yeah, we're we're, mean, we're, flat out, we're flat out not even allowed in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, so, I mean, I remember working in a school for firefighter and paramedics, and I had to tell kids that came in with type 1, I'm like, dude, you're not going to get hired. I'm so sorry. Like, I, I wish I could make this better for you, but you're not. And I don't get that. I don't get why we're charged an arm and a leg for something that we never contracted or like I never did anything weird for. Oh yeah. My parents <laughs> were kind of wrapping yeah. their heads around that too. They're like, I don't know why, why this is a hindrance for you. Cause they don't view it. A lot of people don't view it as a disability. They don't realize no. that. <laughs> why don't you exercise more? Exactly. Like I hear it all. And I'm sure you hear it all. It's some bullshit. So, like, how many years now have you dealt with the Beaties Beast? The what beast? The Beaties. The diabetes. Oh, yeah. 32. I so, I'm, uh, I'm in the pro. It'll be 33 in August. I give it to you. You're longer than I am. My diabetes beast is just old enough to drink now. <laughs> so, but... I, I have to say, I thought we would be farther in common sense with the general public than we are today. Oh, yeah. I, I remember getting called into doctor's offices and they were like, I'm sorry, you have diabetes? Yeah. They're like, you're so skinny. Exactly. I get that all the time. Even now out in public, I tell someone I'm diabetic, but you're not fat. Ah, do you get that? Like, you should I've weighed, add I've, cinnamon. The most I've ever weighed diet. in my entire life because of the diabetes is 180. And that was when I was in high school and doing weightlifting. And when okay, I got out of I'm not going to play or hate with that because it's been COVID time and I like bread. So we're just going to say <laughs> that I have successfully showed my love for bread but even still <laughs> nobody would look at me and be like oh my god you're so fat you're type too and i ah it kills me it kills me every single time you get the dumb questions you know they see whether you have a libre or you have a dexcom or whatever and they're like oh my god is that a pager uh-huh I even got harassed at work several times when I was working, like when I was a paint mixer at Home Depot. <laughs> My boss would hear that thing go off. He says, you need to take that off. And I go, no, I can't. It's attached to me. 
<laughs> we pull the line on it, show them it's a medical device, and the supervisor, well, do you really need to wear that right now? I said, would you like to take me to the hospital today? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. Do you want your insurance to go up? I mean, just asking. Because, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't remember a few, but back in high school, I was constantly watched on my stuff. Like, I couldn't keep my checker and whatnot on me. I had to keep it down at the nurse's office. Oh, yeah. So, like, during high school, you're going down there going, my blood sugar's gonna suck. My blood sugar's gonna <laughs> suck. And it didn't really matter because, well, because back then I was stupid about it and I didn't care. Couldn't have cared less. I remember drinking Arizona green teas like they were going out of style. Never wondering, like, am I more thirsty now because I had one? Nope, didn't matter. Mm. So, I, I, uh, it's, it's one of those things. It's why I love, I love doing this show. Mm hmm because I mean, I, I could spread our stories and maybe not spread them far, but I can spread them. Oh yeah. I can let people know that not all diabetes is the same. I can't tell you how many times I get recommendations for cinnamon. It hurts me. Even when I make the joke posts about the cinnamon, it still hurts me because they oh, yeah. still try it. But I just want people to know, like, it's not always about us having a bitch about things. It's so incredibly serious. People don't know until they know, unfortunately. You know, nobody really cares about diabetes until it happens to them. To this day, I still carry a letter that my parents were sent after I got diagnosed back in 88. It's yeah. from a relative who, uh, their daughter, Ellen, had type 1 diabetes, and she died while she was in college. And what that happened and what they, the advice they gave my parents to at that time was, don't get used to him having it ever. And that was what they said. That's uh, we got Beautiful. used to her. We got used to seeing her being skinny. We got used to seeing her being tired all the time, and we just didn't think anything about it. And that's how they found her. Was that is beautiful and heartbreaking all at the same time? Because I think that as diabetics, we can all look at that, and we can all know what time with that. Like, I remember before being diagnosed and looking at pictures of me, and I'm like, dude, I was a skeleton. How did no one notice that I was I was Skeletor in the background? Mm -hmm. But they don't. They, they don't realize that, and people don't realize how quickly you can go from being uncontrolled in highs or lows to being gone. Yep. And I think like, and we, I've mentioned it, we've mentioned it before that there's that one meme of a spoon. It shows a dot of insulin and then a little bit more. And it says to show you how much can kill a diabetic. And it's true. I mean, it's so true. We make diagnosis and decisions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no on-call. There's, there's nothing we can do. It's up to us. Exactly. That's what scares a lot of people who aren't diabetic and why they try to sleep it underneath the rug, I think, mentally, is because yeah. we remind them of their mortality. And I, I completely agree with you. I think the times... When I wasn't taking care of myself, for me personally, are the hardest times because I wish I had. I wish I had taken it more just knowing that it was going to screw me in the long run. But I didn't. And all that I want to do now is 
show people that they should that you can live a very long life, a very healthy long life with type 1 diabetes. You can oh, live yeah. a complicated life. You can live a super complicated life. You can go on and on and on because that's what diabetes is. Yeah, it doesn't ever leave you. <laughs> no. Like, so I don't know about you. Do you experience neuropathy? I have both peripheral neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy. Okay, I'm talking about the normal neuropathy that happens to your fingers and toes. I don't know what that's called. <laughs> if, you ever want to, if you ever want to make an interesting episode, I can put my hand on the stove for you. <laughs> That's right, how so we're going to close up this episode now because we're getting to the, <laughs> over the hour. But I'm telling you, so you and I are going to talk again and we're going to talk because I have really, really awful neuropathy in my fingers and my toes. It just came upon in the last maybe six to eight months. Oh, yeah. But it's bad. So we are going to have you and I talk about that because I want to, I want to put that out there. I think that your story is really, really moving. So, um, all right. So I want to say thank you so thank much you. to my guest, Mike Nichols. You are Mike, Michael. Do you rather Mike or Michael? I like to joke on that one because people ask me that all the time. And I say, as long as you don't call me stupid, it works. I like that. What if I called you Mickey? That's cool. <laughs> I love it. So, all right. It's been so much fun having you on tonight. I really appreciate you sharing your experience. I hope you had a good time. Well, um, I did. It's just me, so it's only like half awesome compared to what it is when Danny or Mike is on. So, whatever. But I hope you liked it. I can't wait to have you on again. Um, well, definitely. And yeah. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So, thank you for watching another episode of. Dying with Diabetes in America. I am your host, Michelle, and I hope you all have an amazing holiday. We might not see you next week, depending on the holiday travel, but um, I hope you guys have a great time. Thank you.